Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Al Fadi, and I th- want to thank you for joining us again in another one of those episodes of this fabulous series that we've been going through about the Trinity or the doctrine of the Trinity in the Old Testament. And uh, I've been privileged, really, to have our dear brother Anthony Rogers with us here in studio to walk us through the uh, richness of the Word of God and the many passages that we've been basically sharing with everyone here. Today's focus is going to be on the theme that has to do with the person of the Father from the Old Testament. And now this is very important, of course, because I know you've heard it many times, especially in my case from Muslims, that the doctrine of the Trinity as we know it is an invention in the New Testament, not to mention the argument sometimes that God is not called the Father and so on and so forth, and all of this is just a lie and deception by the authors of the New Testament, and the list can go on and on and on. So, with that in mind, Anthony, what say you about all of this? Right. Well, of course, uh, what's most important is what the prophets say, as you know. And uh, here, you know, we're just talking about historic Jewish belief. You know, the Christians aren't coming along and inventing this notion that God is a father. This is just standard uh, Judaism. And the reason it was is because it's found in the prophets. That's right. And so today we're going to focus on the Father as the one we mention first in order, right? We normally mention Father, Son, and Spirit, not because the Father alone is God, uh, but because He is that person of the Godhead who represents the other persons in the outworking of redemption, right? The Son is the one who comes and assumes our nature and therefore represents us to the Father. Right. right, And then the Spirit comes and He brings us to the Father through the Son. And so ordinarily we, we speak in, in this way, you know, the first person, second person, third person. Uh, and uh, we have numerous passages in the Old Testament that identify God as Father in distinction from the other members of the Trinity, the angel or the Son, as we'll see today, That's right. and the Spirit. Well, I mean, it's kind of funny. Uh, speaking of the angel, you know, the, the first passage we're going to look at basically has to do with the fact that it is from Malachi or Malachi or the messenger, you know, basically. In this case, it's a person, of course, who is dealing with that. But this is a very powerful and a rich passage. Right, right. right. Just, just to draw out what you were just saying uh, to make sure that the listeners uh, caught that. The word for uh, we we said before that the word angel doesn't mean a creature; it just means messenger, and it can be used for a human being or a divine person or uh, an angelic creature. And the word for messenger or angel in Hebrew is malach. That's right. And so when you look at a passage from the prophet Malachi in in Hebrew, you you'd say Malachi. My messenger, yeah. Right. It just means my messenger. That's right. And the pro- the the prophet Malachi is obviously not an angelic being. That's right. Right. So so nobody should think that when we say the angel of the Lord is a divine person that we're uh, we're saying that some angelic creature is is divine. That's not our point. We're we're recognizing how these terms are being used in Hebrew. Uh, But here, so in our first slide, we have a passage where God is identified as Father in the sense that he is the creator of everyone, right? Do we not all have one Father, has not one God created us? So all of us, everyone, whether believer or unbeliever, everyone, even, uh, you know, the angels, Right, have one father in the sense that they were created by God. God is the creator and maker of all things. He's the one who gave rise to us, right? Who who caused us to come into being. He's the one who provides like a father provides. Right. Uh, so he is a father in that sense to everyone. So Anthony, I want to play the devil's advocate. You know, you've heard this argument many times, probably from Muslims and others who deny the Trinity, and they'll say, well. Well, you know, isn't this like when you talk Trinity and three persons and all of a sudden you have more than one God? But here it says one God. How can we help people reconcile between what they're thinking versus what the Scripture is actually teaching? You mean when they say that we believe? They assume the three persons of the, of the Trinity as if you're talking three separate gods here. You know? Right. Yeah, that's not the Christian view, obviously. Right. Uh, and, and their reason for, for assuming that is number one, because they don't know how one being can be three persons. That That's one thing, right? It's it's a, 
a, a, a mental issue. They're saying this, I'm not, the mistake here, and I don't know why Muslims make it uh, in one sense, okay, the mistake here is to assume I don't know any other being in my experience that's like that. Every other being I know is one being, one person. Right. So this to me is not possible. But Muslims of all people should recognize that God is not like anyone or anything, right? Exactly. Isn't that, that what the Quran preaches? Yeah, you know? it says that. Yeah. And Isaiah 42:11, and I, uh, or excuse me, not Isaiah, Surah 42:11, and Surah 112:4, they both say there's no one like Allah. Yeah. And so why they would assume that God has to be like us in order for it to be an intelligible or true concept, I, I have no idea. Yeah, exactly. But but really, there, I know on in another sense why. Uh, it's like this. It's because when, even though the Quran says Allah is not like anyone or anything, he really is, right? There's nothing unique really about Allah. Uh, you know, he's one being, one person on on the Islamic understanding. There's there's no fundamental difference there in the way. In he other exists. words, you have a lot of people that are one person. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, so there's nothing and special. One essence, you know. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing special there about Allah. And so when they come to the Trinity, they're puzzled. They're, this really is a unique being. You know, we've never encountered anything like this. But the other problem that stands in the way of Muslims understanding this is they actually think that the Quran is the word of Allah. That's right. And since Allah in the Quran says Christians worship three gods, correct, then they have to think that's what we believe, and they can't accept that we believe something different than that. But you know, we do. We we do believe something different than that, and so th that's really the 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 problem, right? They they have a Quran that's right. misguided them, even though it's called guidance. Right. That's right. And I mentioned that, of course, because you've debated, uh, at least uh, most recently, uh, someone who believes that uh, God is one person, basically. Right. Yeah. Right. So that's something that uh, even those who proclaim themselves to be Christians struggle with sometimes. And, and that's why I wanted to bring it up. But anyway, that will be probably a topic for a different kind of show, maybe. But uh, nevertheless, so we looked at Malachi 2.10. Is there anything else in that passage that you would like to highlight beside uh, the fact that this is the one God who is called the Father, who is the Creator? No, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and that leads us into our, our next slide. And this is, you'll see the heading there where it says, God is the Father of His people in a redemptive or adoptive sense. It's obvious that while God is the creator of everyone, not everyone is in a good relationship with him. That's right. And so spiritually, Scripture distinguishes between those who are God's children and those who aren't. Spiritually, only some people are God's children. And this begins in the garden. Remember, uh, Satan tempted mankind and man sinned, and as a result of that was alienated from God. But God promised that he's going to save people and defeat Satan. But the way he does so is, is significant. It says that I will put enmity, this is in Genesis 3, I will put enmity between your seed, referring to the serpent, and her seed, and he will crush your head and you'll bruise his heel. So there's going to be two seeds, spiritually speaking, the offspring of the serpent and the offspring of the woman. And you see this most clearly in a passage like John 8, where Jesus said to the, uh, the religious leaders who opposed him, you're of your father, the devil. That's right. Right? And then Jesus says that the true children of God are children uh, spiritually. They believe in the Son. Uh, they have faith like Abraham. That's right. Those are the true children. And then, you know, the passage in John 8 that you're referring to is powerful because Jesus did not really object to calling God the Father. He objected to how you should behave if you truly follow the true Father. Right. The true Father, that means you believe. Just like Abraham, he used that example, Abraham believed. But you rejected no one that the Father has sent. Therefore, you cannot say, God is our Father. Your Father is the devil as right. a result of this. And so we see this in uh, Exodus 4. And in the slide we have for Exodus 4, uh, where God, at the time when he comes to redeem Israel, he says to Moses, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, let my son go that he may serve me, but you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Right. And so uh, here is the beginning of that relationship with Israel. Now, God has already covenanted with their forefathers, right? Correct. Abraham, Correct. Isaac, and Jacob, and said he's going to do this. But now he's coming and putting that promise into uh, effect. And it, it's even further clarified by the next slide where we have Deuteronomy 32. 
And you know, just one quick comment here, if you don't mind me uh, sharing this, I wanna highlight this particular one. You know, our Muslim friends, of course, struggle with the idea, how can God be one in essence and three in persons? So my question to them, even in the Quran, they call him Beni Israel, okay? Mm. Are you talking one person? Or are you talking massive group of people? Did Moses go to rescue one guy or a whole group of people, yet God called him in the singular, my son? Not even my sons, my son, my firstborn as an emphasis. So why is that acceptable? But at the same time, we reject the idea that God, who is one in essence, can also reveal himself to us in a way that we cannot understand, right? You know, right, right. nothing is like him. So right. anyway, I just want to You have that sort of thing all throughout the Old Testament, unity and plurality. That's right. Or the one exactly. and the many. And uh, yeah, some people don't recognize that. But as soon as you start talking about the Trinity, all of a sudden it's like uh, what well, we don't find know. a problem you know, with elsewhere all of a sudden is problematic exactly. when we see it here exactly. in relation to God. Yeah. So in Deuteronomy 32, uh, it says, do you thus repay the Lord O oh, foolish and unwise people, is he not your father who has bought you? He has made you and established you. So again, you have God referred to as father. This is why in Deuteronomy 32, it's so heinous that the people are, are rebellious. In Deuteronomy 32, you, you have this song that Moses is teaching the people to sing, and he says it's going to be a testimony to them when they rebel against the Lord. That's right. And he's saying it's, it's, it's foolish and, 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 and heinous that you've rebelled against him because he is your father, right? Just like rebelling against your own father who is the one who brought you into the world and has provided for you and cares for you, for you to rebel against him is terrible in the extreme. And how much more than in the case of God? If, you, if he has done all this for Israel and has brought them to himself as uh, sons, than how terrible it is that they've rebelled against him. But notice how he became their father. This is the point we especially need to see. Is not he your father who has bought you? That's the word for redemption. That's right. Right. Remember, in, in all our, our previous episodes, we keep seeing this theme of redemption. God redeems by means of the angel of his presence and the Holy Spirit. That means this somebody is, paid the price. Right. Yeah. And so this is how God brings otherwise alienated people into a relationship with him as his sons through redemption. It doesn't happen automatically, right? Our Muslim That's friends right. like to think that nothing really happens, right? Yeah. You just say some words uh, and, and God just uh, says you're my son. No, they don't say that you're, they're his sons. But, but that's they, their, their claim, their accusation against us. Right. Yeah. But here we have this, this very clear idea that God becomes father of, of people through redemption. And, you know, I mean, you've heard the same, of course, there's nothing for free, right, you know? I mean, <laughs> if, if I get something for free, it means somebody paid for it, right? You know? And we right. don't think about that, you know, but technically speaking, how did I obtain it if somebody else did not pay for its production or buying it and giving it to me or something? But, same true. Uh, yeah. here, nothing, I mean, the grace of God is not free. Mm -hmm. Jesus paid for it. Right. I, I hear people say a lot, uh, you know, why can't? God just forgive without exactly. the need for a sacrifice. Exactly. Yeah. And they also say, didn't Jesus himself teach this in the Lord's Prayer, where it says, Let, uh, you know, forg uh, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. What they don't realize is when we sin against somebody and they forgive us, they're forgiving us to their own hurt. That's right? Right. Suppose I sin against somebody by taking $100 and then they choose to forgive me for that. Right you know, that now they've lost out on a hundred dollars unless the terms of it are that I have to return it or, or something whatever I did to them they've lost something they've lost right. trust maybe they've been hurt you know it doesn't matter just forgiving me doesn't mean the hurt is not there right technically speaking right so so what we've seen so far is that the God of the Old Testament is a father he's the father of all by virtue of creating them and then he's the father in particular of his people whom he has redeemed and brought into a saving relationship with himself. But there's a reason why God relates to creatures in this way. And it's not, you know, just that God, uh, you know, God in himself, if he were not a father, you know, why would he create this kind of relationship with creatures? Correct. Why would he desire it after creatures fell from that condition? Right? Uh, why would he go to the lengths that he does to redeem people if it's not fundamental to his nature? Correct. And we start to see that when we look at a passage like uh, 
Proverbs 30. Which people can see in, the, in front of them right now. Right. Proverbs 30, re remember, this is an Old Testament text, right? This is Solomon, the king of uh, – well, predominantly the Psalms are written by Solomon. Uh, this, this particular uh, proverb, excuse me, this particular proverb is written by a man named Agur. And it's important to realize what he's doing here. Agur is, you know, basically uh, chiding those who just assume that they're they're brilliant, right? And so he's sort of, uh, you know, throwing in their this back back in their faces. You know, you guys aren't really that brilliant, you know, and and neither am I when it comes to God, right? All of us when we stand before God are like pygmies, right? We're not really as smart as we think we are. And so he says here, he says, "Surely I am more stupid than any man, right? And if I'm stupid." <laughs> You know, and, and your understanding isn't even where mine is, then how much more can we say that you're, you're dull, right? Uh, so he's receiving this by revelation. Surely I am more stupid than any man, and I do not have the understanding of a man. Neither have I learned wisdom, nor do I have the knowledge of the Holy One. Who has ascended into heaven and descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped the waters in his garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name or his son's name? Surely you know. That's right. Right, And then the idea here is that, that God is incomprehensible. He does all of this, which is beyond our understanding. This, the, the same kind of this, – this language here is like what you see in the book of Job when God yep. appears to Job. And he's saying, where were you? you know, do you know what I'm doing when, when this stuff happens? You, know, you don't know any exactly. of this. Exactly. Exactly. And so this, this knowledge of the Holy One includes a knowledge not only of the Lord but of his Son. Exactly. These two members right here. Right. What is his name or his son's name? And if I may add, he wrote it by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, oh, and yeah, so you have the Holy Spirit speaking of uh, the Lord and his son. And you actually see that all throughout the Old uh, Testament, really. Uh, but another passage is in Psalm 2 and in our next slide. And if we look at the whole psalm, what you have is this interesting, what I call a trialogue. Uh, you know, you know what a dialogue is, right? That's, That's right. where two people are speaking. But really, Psalm two is a trialogue. You have three persons speaking. Correct. Yeah. Because in the psalm, so first of all, you have you have uh, some unnamed person speaking. He says, "Why do the nations rage and the peoples conspire in vain? They take their stand against the Lord and against and his, his anointed his, one." His anointed, exactly. So there's this person speaking about the Lord and his anointed. The Lord is obviously the Father. The anointed means Messiah right. or Christ. So who's the speaker? Well, we're actually told who the speaker is in the New Testament when we're uh, told that uh, it was David by the Spirit who said exactly. this. Exactly. Exactly. Right in uh, in Saul or Acts uh, chapter four. We're told that this was said by the Spirit. And so the Spirit introduces the Father and the Son. And then uh, here in verse 10 of the psalm, it says, Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son. That's an expression that means worship the Son. Bow down to him. Right? Acknowledge him as sovereign over you. It, this is what's being addressed to the rulers of the earth, right? right? Kiss the son that he not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Notice, I mean, the son has a wrath and you need to take rest and refuge in him. Right. And, and, and that wrath, of course, is that wrath of God that's deserved. That's right. Uh, you know, we, des we, we deserve to have God's wrath poured upon us because of our sins. But how do we escape that? Right. By kissing the Son. Yeah, so it's almost you honor the Father by honoring the Son. Right. Isn't that what Jesus says in John 5? Yeah. And, and who's telling us this? The David, Holy Spirit. And by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. Right. I mean, it's, uh, it's powerful. I mean, absolutely powerful when you see things like this. Right. So, so this, this is another text that, again, shows a plurality of persons, but our specific focus, just to remind people, is on the fact that the Old Testament identifies God as a father. He's the father of all creation because he's the creator. He's the father of his redeemed people right. by virtue of redemption. But all of this because ultimately he's, he's the first person in the Trinity 
who from all eternity has related to the second person as a father does to a son. Uh, they share the same nature, and uh, yet they're distinct personally from each other. Amen. And Amen. so this is exactly what we'd expect in the Bible if God is by nature tripersonal, that he would create man and then want to relate to man in this special way. Uh, if, if God is more like the God of the Quran, then he wouldn't relate to creatures in any more than a uh, master-slave relationship, right? That's right. That's right. Thank you so much, brother. And uh, I hope everybody can see why this series is very exciting. Obviously, this is not the end of it. This is just probably we're halfway through what we anticipate to be the length of this series. So uh, join us again next time. Until we do so, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching. Please like our video, and we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Sierra International. And be sure also to click the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we upload new videos into the channel. And finally, I like to prayerfully encourage you to become a patron through Patreon. Your giving is much needed and will enable us to produce more and more of videos like this so that we can publish them on a weekly basis. So thank you in advance.